couple of nights ago. My whole family, except for Jesse, who's on the ultimate retreat, we gathered around the television set to watch the Partridge family. I heard it was back on Nickelodeon, and so I was kind of curious to tune into that quintessential 1970s program. Remember Shirley Jones, David Cassidy, the Partridge family. So we sat there and we watched this show, having just finished dinner, turned it on, and we were commenting upon the 70s those days, my kids were very curious about, when Mary, who's my kindergartner, is watching this show intently. And the Partridge family, they, in this particular segment, go into a church. And Mary's eyes get as big as saucers as she sees the Partridge family go into a church. And she looks around the church and she looks over at me and says, Daddy, did men used to wear ties to church in the olden days? <laughs> And it struck me. She's never been to a church where they wear ties. She thought that was the olden days, the 70s. Ancient history, it's one hymn that we'll never really sing, not honestly around here, blessed be the tie that binds. <laughs> she was just blown away that people would wear ties to church. Well, the fellowship... I, I appreciate so much, personally, the informality that we enjoy, the simplicity that we have, the freedom in Christ that we celebrate. It's something which is very precious to me to be a part of, of this group. But I suppose the thing that I enjoy as much as any single item of what the Lord is doing here in the fellowship family is what the Lord is doing evangelistically. That is, seeing people week after week after week open up their hearts to Jesus Christ and be born again. If you've been around this summer, you know that we're seeing once again a harvest of souls, 30, 40 people a week opening up their heart to Jesus Christ and being baptized. It's something that's very, very special. Something that's very, very wonderful. Now, when people come here and they, and they see folks getting saved and being baptized, I'm not infrequently asked, hey, what is your follow-up program? These people seem to come to get saved. How do you follow them up? What's your program? Well, really, we don't have a follow-up program as such. What we do have is a follow-up person. Not a program, but a person. And that person, well, let's see what Paul has to say in our text and see what he says about the follow-up program for those that were coming into faith there at Rome. In Romans chapter 16, to set the stage... We saw on Wednesday last that Paul had dictated this entire epistle to a man named Tertius. His name means third, which indicates that he was a slave. Tertius, mentioned here in verse 22, and also another slave, Cortus, at the end of verse 23. Because you see, Cortus means fourth. And in Paul's time, if you were a slave... They didn't give you a name. They just gave you a number. You weren't worthy of a name. So the first slave in your house was one. The second slave was two. The third was three. The fourth was four and five and six and so on and so forth. You were literally a number. That was your name. Slaves were insignificant. And yet here are these slaves being brought into significance as they come into a knowledge of Jesus Christ and are brought into the kingdom. Tertius, third, 
Quartus, fourth, A. They have significance eternally. Their names are recorded at the end of this epistle, you see. You might feel like a number. No one cares about you. No one takes notice of you. Let me tell you something. The Lord has a plan for you. He's got your number. And if you'll give yourself to Him and start walking with Him, you'll find significance. Ask Tertius. I, Tertius, verse 22, who wrote this epistle, I salute you in the Lord. So he was the one who actually did the writing. Paul the Apostle did the dictating. This ex-slave, Tertius, was the secretary actually doing the writing, and here he puts in his own note, I salute you. Paul then goes on and wraps it up in verse 24 as he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Paul's usual closing. The grace of the Lord be with you. God's grace be upon you. He's finished. But wait, there's three more verses. What's going on? At this point, Paul does what he frequently is inclined to do. He grabs the pen himself, if you would, and this is his autograph, these final three verses. He now does the writing physically. Why, he makes mention of that practice in 2 Thessalonians. I'll read it to you. At the close of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 16, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you. Then, verse 17, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is token in every epistle, so I write. So in 2 Thessalonians 3, 16 and 17, for you Bible students, we see that it was Paul's custom after closing off his dictation to grab the pen and add a final thought or two and autograph the letter. Did you hear yesterday, the 1952 Mickey Mantle Tops baseball card, rookie card, is now being auctioned off, $35,000 a card. It's a lot of money. Jose Canseco's card that went for $5,000 a year ago is now down to $500. <laughs> Jose Canseco, remember he used to play for the A's? Now he's playing for the Texas Rangers, having a horrible season. In fact, a month ago, a ball in the outfield bounced off his head, went over the fence, a home run. <laughs> Did you see that clip? It's not the way to get ahead in baseball, I'll tell you. It's not the way to see the value of your cards go up, so his cards are going down, whereas Mickey Mantle's cards continue to skyrocket through the roof. And if you were lucky enough to have that card signed by Mickey Mantle, it puts it in the $100,000 category. Amazing to me that people are paying that kind of money for autographed baseball cards. Wouldn't you love to have the autographed Romans epistle? The one that was actually... Wouldn't that be heavy? That'd be great. Paul would autograph his letters, you see, by grabbing the pen from the secretary and then finishing off a final thought. And watch this. This was so important to Paul that after he finished dictation, he said to Tertius, now let me write this. And he takes the pen, and now in these last three verses, he writes his closing and climactic thought. He says, verse 25, Now... After closing it off in verse 24, amen, uh, now. Ever know preachers that after they close it off, they go on? I heard about one once. Now. <laughs> to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Oh, you at Rome, Paul would say. Now to him, not a program, but a person, to him who is able to establish you, stabilize you, steady you. 
now to him who is able, who is willing, who will indeed do the stabilizing, to him who is of power to establish you according to my gospel. By the way, Bible students, some people say, using this verse, that Paul had a unique gospel. It was uniquely from him. It was different than the gospel that Peter preached, or that John shared, or that even Jesus gave. And there are those so-called Bible scholars who say that Paul had a unique gospel different than the others. And they use this verse to prove that point where Paul calls the gospel, my gospel. Wait a minute. It doesn't mean it's uniquely from him. It means it's personal and important to him. Not my gospel uniquely from me, different than what John is preaching or Peter is writing or what Jesus was sharing. No, but it's my gospel. I own it. It's real to me. It's impacting to me. It's my gospel, you see. I would refer you to John chapter 20. There you see Mary at the tomb. The tomb is empty. She begins weeping. And one of the angels there on that Easter Sunday morning says, why are you weeping? And she says, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. She didn't say simply they've taken away the Lord. It was personal. He was important. They've taken away my Lord. Does that mean that Jesus was just Mary's Lord? No. It means that Jesus was indeed, though, the Lord of Mary, you see. Or later on in John 20, Thomas, when he heard reports of the resurrection, said, I won't believe these stories unless I can put my fingers in the holes of his hands and in the, so in the hole in his side. Only then will I believe these stories about a resurrection. Then Jesus appeared. And said, Thomas, check it out. My hands, my side. And Thomas fell down and said, My Lord and my God. Oh, it's personal. It's real. And that is what Paul is declaring. My gospel. Not uniquely from me, but it's real to me. It's made an impression on me. It's not just the gospel theologically, it's mine. And Paul says, now unto him, the Lord, who is able to establish you according to my gospel, that which has impacted me, the preaching of Jesus Christ, which is, verse 25 goes on to say, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the beginning of the world. But now, verse 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, is made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Paul says, he will establish you, new Christians, you Romans. He has the power to do it. According to my gospel, which has impacted me, the preaching of Jesus Christ, which I've delivered to you so faithfully through this letter. He's real. Then he says this, now tune in, don't miss it. It's important stuff. Even as this is according to, verse 25, the mystery. The mystery of Christianity. The mystery that was not known until now. 
Again, Bible students, when you come across the word mystery in the Scriptures, it's the Greek word mysterion. It doesn't mean that which can't be figured out. But the word means that which was once hidden is now revealed and known. Like those commercials for a new car model where they'll show you in the magazines or on the TV screen or whatever the new model that's going to be introduced next month and it's covered up with a sheet or it's covered up with a canvas. You can see the shape of it but you can't really see the car and they're trying to build your curiosity, get you ready for the mystery. What mystery? The unveiling of the Lexus or whatever it's supposed to be. The engineer already knows what's underneath that canvas, that cover. The designer already knows the shape of the car. But it's hidden until the right moment. That's what Paul is saying. There was a mystery that was hidden until this time. Now, what is that mystery? And why is Paul saying, I'm convinced that you're going to make it? That he's going to establish you because it's according to the mystery which was hidden, unknown, but is now revealed. What is that mystery? And how could Paul be so confident that those to whom he was writing in Rome, you're going to make it? And how can I be confident that those who are baptized Sunday after Sunday, they're going to do good? And how can I be confident when I look at Peter John or Benjamin or Christy or my neighbor Steve or his son Damien or my across the street Bob and Fran or Larry and Jerry? How can I be sure that Barry Fronick's sitting here? How can I be sure he's going to make it? What is this mystery that Paul is referring to that says, I'm confident that you're going to make it. He's going to establish you, you who are in Rome, according to the mystery. What mystery, Paul? This is the mystery. It begins to unfold in Romans chapter 11. We studied that passage right around verse 25 where he uses the word mysterion or musterian, pardon me, for the first time. The mystery that the Gentiles, those that weren't Jews, are going to be brought into the kingdom. Wow. That's an interesting thought. A novel idea to those in that day that the Gentiles are going to be brought into the kingdom. The Jews would say, that's a mystery. The Gentiles? Why, we thought they were simply fodder to keep the fires of hell stoked up. The Gentiles, the heathen, are going to be brought into the kingdom? But wait, the mystery goes on. For the mystery is unfolded, you see, as Paul says here in chapter 16, verse 26, this mystery is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets. What prophets? The mystery that was previously hidden until now is now made manifest by the prophets, the New Testament writers. The New Testament letters are unveiling the mystery, revealing it more fully. So in chapter 11, Gentiles brought in. Then Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, he talks about the Musterian again. Bible students, teachers, jot it down. Don't let these passages go by you. They're important. Understand. Chapter 11 of Romans, the Gentiles brought in. Chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, the Jews and Gentiles brought into unity. Not just into the kingdom, keeping arm's distance, eyeing each other suspiciously, but they're made into a new identity called the church, the body of Christ. This is mysterious. A new category. Before it was just Jews or Gentiles. Now in this unveiling of the mystery, the Gentiles are brought in and Jews and Gentiles are merged together, Ephesians 3, 2 through 6, into a new entity called the church. 
the body. No more differentiation between Jews and Gentiles. Or for that matter, between men and women, bond and free. Black and white. Yuppie and hippie. Doesn't matter where you're from or who you are, what your thing is culturally or what your background is ethnically. There's a new entity called the church. It's a mystery. To these, in that day, this is revolutionary. Wow. But wait a minute. We get to the heart of the issue. What I want you to see today. What gives me tranquility and certainty as I look at my kids and for my life personally. The heart of the mystery is in Colossians. Turn there, would you please? The Musterian is further described, this mystery in Colossians. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, page 265. Colossians chapter 1. Ah, verse 25. Colossians 1, verse 25. As we get to the heart of the mystery, you see. I am made a minister, Paul says, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Verse 26, even the mystery... Here it is again. The unveiling of something that was previously unknown. I've been made a minister to this end, to reveal to you the mystery which hath been hidden from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to the saints, to whom God, verse 27, would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope, the hope of glory. Here it is, the heart of the mystery. It's Christ in you. The Gentiles who are be, being brought in, the Jews and Gentiles being made a new entity, Here's the heart of the whole issue. The heart of this mystery. It works. You're going to make it. You'll be established. Whatever you were before, Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter because now it's Christ in you. That is the hope of glory. Not a program given to you. Not rules and regulations laid on you. Not expectations that are placed before you, but rather, here's the mystery. Christ is in you. He lives in you, and that is the hope of glory. Now, the word hope, in the Bible sense of the word, as you know, means the absolute expectation of coming good. It doesn't mean, I hope Peter John makes it. I hope... Jesse makes it. Hey, I can look at Peter and Christy and Jesse and Mary and Benjamin, my children, and I can say it's Christ in them that is the hope of glory, the absolute certainty that they are going to make it, that I'm going to come through too. Because it's Christ in me, and it's Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. That's the mystery. Not religion, not programs, not 12-stepping, not trying harder, not getting it together, not follow-up types of materials. As good as those things may be, that's not the key. The key is Christ is living in you. So I know that when my kids are tempted to do something that they shouldn't do, or when I plunge into something which I shouldn't be doing, thinking, saying, 
I know Christ is in me and Christ is in them. This is the mystery. And that even at the very time of the temptation or of the sin or of the difficulty, that they're going to be exceedingly uncomfortable. And the Lord will let them go so far and then He'll pull them back. They might splat. I might get spanked. But I know that He is in them. He is in me. He is faithful to establish you and establish your kids and your friends and your neighbors and those baptized Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. This is the mystery, not a philosophy, not a good way of living, not activism in moral politics or whatever it might be. It's Christ in you. Did you read in the paper, end of last week, Amazing story. In Hawaii, a Mrs. Mimi Lazarus Goldberg. Her husband died. They were holding the services, not in Hawaii, but they were going to hold the services in their hometown of Oakland, California. So she went to the Nu'uana mortuary, and she had them tend the body and they were to ship the body of her husband from Hawaii to Oakland, California. True story. So Mrs. Mimi Lazarus Goldberg trusts the morticians and so forth and so on to tend this, this matter. When the casket arrives in Oakland, they open it up and there is Mrs. Mimi Goldberg's husband's body, along with, in a bag, a dead pig. Now for a Jewish woman to ship her husband and find that in the transport box was also a dead pig caused a great deal of understandable consternation. Here's what happened. The New Uwana mortuary was planning a luau. They were having a luau that evening on the beach there outside of Waikiki, and somebody brought in a small pig that was going to be taken to the luau, as is custom. They put this little pig in a plastic bag. Somebody else came in the mortuary and for some reason assumed that those contents in the plastic bag, which this person did not look into, were personal effects of the passed away, the deceased. So this person put that bag, the baby pig, in the casket, and it was shipped on its way. The clincher is, when Mrs. Mimi Goldberg found out what happened, of course she was chagrined, a Jewish lady, sending her husband's body with a pig in the same box. It's not a good match. And she turned the matter over to her lawyer, and the lawyer said, this is a matter that is of great concern to us. And the person that was telling the story, commentating on it, said the lawyer indicated that he would go hog wild over this issue. <laughs> Recorded in the San Francisco Chronicle last week, I thought, my goodness, interesting story. Lawyers upset, funeral home workers, mistaken, terrible problems coming down, all because they sent a dead body, if you would, and there was no safeguards to make sure that it would arrive in the way that it was intended to. Listen carefully. A lot of people view Christianity that way. Oh, we get saved and and, and now here's some rules, here's some regulations, here's some standards, here's a code to live by, some activities to take on. No way. No way. Jesus Christ and true Christianity, and this is what Paul is pressing into, this mystery, 
It is not intended to make bad people good. It is not intended to make good people better. But the mystery is this, to make dead men alive. Christ in you. We're not shipping you out. Here's some rules and regulations. I hope you make it to your destiny. It's Christ in you. Now, if Mr. Goldberg in the casket was alive, that event would have never taken place. Well, am I going to make it? What if I'm shipped with the wrong stuff? What if I get involved in the wrong deal? What if my kids, what if my parents, what if my friends, what's going to happen? Paul says, now unto him that is able to establish you. Why? Because he's alive. It's Christ in you that is the hope of glory, you see. And he is going to see you through. And this is the mystery hidden from the ages past. They couldn't get it. They couldn't understand it. That, wow, Christ would be living in men. And so, one more passage and then we are done. The last time this mystery and this mystery is mentioned, turn with me to Timothy's epistle. Paul's writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says this, oh man, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is this mystery. Great is this Musterian. Are my friends going to live godly? Are my kids going to do well? That's the question Paul says without controversy. Great is this mystery of godliness. That God was manifested in the flesh. When? When Jesus came as the babe of Bethlehem. That he was justified in the Spirit. When? When the Spirit came upon Jesus at the Jordan River and he was baptized in water and baptized in power by the Spirit. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And seen of angels. When was he seen of angels? After he was baptized in water and baptized with the Spirit. He was driven into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. And he overcame the temptation, and it says the angels came and ministered to him. Preached on to the Gentiles. When? All after he came back from the temptations. The next thing we, do, we see him doing is healing and sharing and teaching and preaching. Not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, the Roman centurion who had such faith. The Syrophoenician woman who was concerned about her daughter's situation. Read the Gospels. He was sharing himself, not just with the Jews, but also with the Gentiles. Believed on in the world when, yes, they believed on him. Crowds gathered around him. People began to march behind him. But ultimately, things caved in seemingly there in Jerusalem. We will not have this man rule over us, and they crucified him. But it was all part of the plan. For you see, he died for our sins on that tree. And after that, he was received up into glory. He rose again from the dead. And he went to heaven. Now Paul says, great is this mystery. The mystery of godliness. God manifested in the flesh. Justified by the Spirit. Seen of angels there in the wilderness preached amongst the Gentiles, believed on in the world, taken up into heaven. What is the mystery? It's this. That Jesus who is victorious over the enemy. Who never succumbed to any temptation personally. Justified by the Father as the voice rang out audibly. Yet a person who can relate to you and me, this same Jesus received up into glory, up into heaven, and came to us by sending us his Spirit. He lives in my heart. Not only does he live in heaven, 
but by his spirit he lives in the hearts of men and women. This is the mystery. And they and you and me will be godly based upon the Musterian. Christ is in you. <laughs> That's the hope. For some reason, as I drove to the Medford office on Wednesday morning, planning on studying for Wednesday night, I felt an overwhelming urge to keep on driving. You've had those times when you just can't explain what's going on. You just, ah, man. So I drove right by the office, found myself on the freeway headed south towards Ashland. I hadn't done this in about three and a half years or longer, but I found myself just drawn to go on Wednesday morning to Lithia. I thought, I'll just study there. So I get into Lithia Park, go up into the woods a bit, and I begin to open up this book on the Apostle Paul. Just sat down on the bench, the picnic table, opened it up, and thought, this is, this is, I haven't been here in years. This is going to be great. Just studying here, reading about Paul a bit. Just cracked it open, and this guy comes up to me. One of the most interesting people that I've had the privilege of meeting in my life thus far. 75 years of age. Clear, piercing blue eyes. Craggly face. Interesting persona. I don't know where he came from. Just all of a sudden he's standing before me. And he says, what you reading? <laughs> and I said, I said, well, I said, I'm reading a book about Paul. And this classic guy reared back and sort of belly laughed. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, yeah, he said. I'm an atheist. I'm an evolutionist. And I said, well, if all be a monkey's uncle. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and then he told me why he was an evolutionist. And I was astounded. I was amazed. I was blown out. The guy's grasp on science, cosmology, philosophy, just absolutely flabbergasted me. His quoting of authors and books and statistics of which I was vaguely familiar, I knew that he knew what he was talking about. And we talked and I thought the conversation might go for 10, 20, 30 minutes perhaps. Three and a half hours later, I said to him, what do you do for a living? What did you do? He goes, I was a diesel mechanic. I said, your grasp of philosophy, of theology, of cosmology, science, we've been talking here for three and a half hours, debating, sharing, really enjoying the conversation immensely. I said, how can this be that you were a diesel mechanic with that kind of educational background? He goes, oh, I'm self-taught. He said, I just realized a number of years ago how little I knew. And so he was a guy that started reading voraciously. In fact, the night before we were talking, he had finished three books in one evening substantial books. Maybe, maybe the most intelligent person I've ever talked to. And we began talking back and forth and I was so engaged in, in this discussion with him. Talking about the relevancy of Jesus Christ, the viability of the creationist model. 
talking about the irrefutable proof of Jesus' resurrection. In his sharing with me, he said, I don't even call men, men. I said, what do you call them? He said, homo sapiens. And I said, why is that? He said, because men do not deserve the title of man. The way that we treat each other, what goes on among us, what goes on within us, absolutely refutes the designation man. And he went on to explain a little more why that was so. I said, so what's the solution to this observation that you're making about what I would call the depravity of mankind, the evil of, of humanity? He said, like the dinosaurs, like so many creatures before us, the earth itself will dispel man. And some other life form will evolve that will be a step beyond, a step above. And I said, sir, are you suggesting that there is no hope for man or homo sapien to even evolve into what you would say would be a social creature? I don't think so. And he shared his reasoning why some more. And I said, man, then you have no hope at all for anything, do you? He said, for today... I'm enjoying talking with you, he said. You're the first Christian, he said, I've talked to that's listened and been able to interact with me. He said, I've enjoyed this immensely. But I have no hope for tomorrow. And after another half hour or so, and it was really getting late, we closed off the conversation, and I said his name, and then I said, God bless you. And he looked at me and laughed. What could he say? He couldn't say, God bless you too. <laughs> and I shook his hand, and I said, oh, man, when the Lord gets a hold of your life with the experiences you've had, the places you've lived, the books you've read, the things that you know, when the Lord gets a hold of you, I said, you're going to be one dynamic brother, one dynamic part of the body of Christ. And he chuckled and laughed again and walked away. I sat there and I was amazed, and I'll tell you why. Just as strong as the impression was to me to go there to Lithia Park, I know now, without a doubt, it was a divine appointment. So too was this impression. The impression was this. As I saw this man, I was realizing that either I was the first stop on a new life for him or the last opportunity he'll have to give his heart and mind to Christ Jesus. I know that to be so. I can't tell you how except to say this is the mystery of godliness. Christ in us. I know that for him it's either the first stop that day in Lithia Park on a whole new life or it's the final stop that God sent his way. I pray and hope that this man will open up his heart to the mystery not philosophy, not cosmology, not theology. Christ in you, man. The living Jesus will live in you. And hey, I said to him, he's going to navigate your life. He's going to see you through both now and in the ages to come. It's the hope of glory. The Christ in you by his spirit will be drawn to the Christ in heaven, just like an iron magnet draws iron clippings, so too Christ in me is drawn to the Christ who's in heaven, and I'm going to be spending eternity. It's magnetic, it's wonderful. We're destined, you see, the hope of glory. I leave you with this thought.
Without the internal Christ, the mystery of godliness, Christ in you, man is sentenced to either despair, to legalized religion, to worrying about neighbors and loved ones and friends and others. But if we understand the mystery, Christ living internally, great is the mystery of godliness, Christ who relates to us, died for us, rose again and now lives in us, that is the great mystery. And guess what? You're going to make it. So are these who were baptized. So are my children. So are my family and friends and neighbors, all that are really recipients of this mystery, Christ in them. That's the key. Paul writes that to the Romans saying, hey, this is the mystery. He's going to establish you because he lives in you. What a beautiful comfort that is for me. Father, I pray today that those of us that are concerned about whether we'll make it or about our neighbors and friends or children and loved ones, I pray that even now we might have a greater understanding of the mysteria, the mystery, that you brought us in, that you've made us one, that you live inside. Being confident that you who have begun a good work will continue it. So for all those, Lord, who we've seen come to you, those that truly have, those that truly did. We now commit to you and our own hearts as well. Thanking you, Father, that you sent your Son to live in our hearts. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand?